Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Benedict Walter from the Secretariat of the Network for Improving Quality of Care for Maternal, Newborn and Child Health. We are going to start this webinar in one minute. So as far as I see, everybody can hear as well. You all muted and I'm just giving one more minute for people to join. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this first webinar. It's organized um, by UNICEF, the World Health Organization, in collaboration with the Network for Improving Quality of Care for Maternal, Newborn, and Child Health. And the series will cover a series of topics on transforming care for small and sick newborns. I will just want to remind you of a few house rules for today. You are all muted on entry and so that the speakers today can present without any interruptions. Please do not start your video cameras as well. That will put too much pressure on them on the Internet. And please use the chat box on the bottom right of your screen to type your question to the presenter. We will read them out at the end. You have three presentations today, which will last about 30 to 35 minutes, followed by about 25 minutes for question and answer. Again, in the chat box, type them as we go and we will read them out and the presenter will answer as many as possible as they come at the end of this session. Your facilitator today for this session is Dr. Ornella Lincetto, who is a senior medical officer at WHO, a neonatologist and a public health expert. She will introduce your three speakers and the, the session, the, the, the structure of the session today. Ornella, over to you. And uh, welcome to, I don't see the slides, but uh, welcome to everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for those who are in the evening and uh, to this uh, webinar session. I still don't see the slides. Uh, and uh, so WHO, um, together with the UNICEF and support of partners, including USAID, Save the Children. Next slide. Um, next. Uh, the London School, uh, the professional organization and, uh, and others have the, uh, collaborated for uh, developing a technical report on care of small and sick newborns. So it's, it's titled Survive and Thrive, Transforming Care for a Very Small and Sick Newborn. And uh, the report uh, outlines uh, what is the global burden of the health, uh, so the showcase the progress, summarize what can be done, to transform care for small and sick newborn and demonstrates also the importance of data to guide investment in improving quality and equity. And it concludes with a call, uh, a call to action to accelerate progress towards uh, SDG 3.2 for uh, to ensure that every newborn has the chance to, uh, to live uh, a healthy and productive life. So the report has uh, six chapters and uh, which were contributed uh, uh, with contribution from 94 authors from 16 countries. So uh, next slides. The, today on the chat, we described chapter one and uh, our speakers are Mary Kinney from Save the Children and Dr. Uh, uh, Ayai Kera from Commissioner for Maternal uh, Child and Adolescent Health in the Ministry of Health of India. And I will uh, present at the end of two slides on uh, COVID. Please, uh, uh, Mary Kinning, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ornella, and greetings to everyone. And thank you for joining the webinar. 
The main takeaway from our webinar is that the global community needs to expand their focus from strengthening essential newborn care for all newborns to include strengthening care for the most vulnerable newborns, the small and the sick ones. In this presentation, we will focus on the key messages of the first chapter. This includes showing the link with global strategies and frameworks, such as the Convention on the Rights of the Child, presenting the importance of family-centered care, and finally showing how we have learned from lessons from our past. Sorry, my slides froze. Yeah. This graph shows the projected neonatal mortality of each region if progress were to continue at the current trajectory. What we see is that the rate of mortality is too slow for countries to meet the SDG, SDG target for ending preventable newborn deaths, which is at least 12 deaths per 1,000 live births by 2030. And this is shown with the blue star here. About 40 countries will still need to double their current rate of progress to meet the goal, and many others will have to close the equity gap within their countries. And as you can see at the current rate, it will take a century before a newborn that is born in Sub-Saharan Africa will have the same chance of survival as a newborn born in North America, Europe, or Australia today. And there's a common myth that we will achieve the 2030 SDG target for ending preventable newborn mortality if we just roll out essential newborn care. The fact is that extensive measures are needed to achieve the target in all settings. This includes high effective coverage of antenatal care, care around the time of birth, postnatal care, as well as inpatient care for small and sick newborns. This report is showing us that we will not meet the SDG unless we transform care for every newborn, including the most vulnerable. So who are the most vulnerable? From a clinical perspective, this includes newborns who are born too soon or preterm, who are born too small or low birth weight, or who are acutely ill. From a public health perspective, newborns most likely to die include those who are born small and sick in the most marginalized groups, rural areas and urban slums, and in humanitarian settings with added susceptibility from factors such as poverty, ethnicity, gender bias, maternal age and educational status, disability, and low literacy of the caregiver. Vulnerability is most acute in low and middle income countries where health systems face specific challenges. And there's a myth that we need to focus more at the community level and not at the hospital level to meet the SDG target. The truth, however, is that globally now, 80% of births take place in the facilities and community care is more effective when it's linked to health care in the facilities. We recognize that a number of key global initiatives have contributed considerably to the improvements of maternal, newborn, and child health during the last two decades. Chief among these are the Millennium Development Goals, now the Sustainable Development Goals, the Global Strategy for Women's, Children's, and Adolescent Health, and the Principles of Universal Health Coverage. These strategies were guided by the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the Safe Motherhood Initiative, the Every Newborn Action Plan, the Continuum of Care Framework, and WHO's Framework on Integrated People-Centered Health Services. All of these are important and described in this first chapter, and we're going to briefly discuss four of these initiatives and frameworks. First of all, newborn health is a human right. Article 6 and 24 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child emphasizes the right of every newborn to attain the highest standard of health and health care. Professional associations and other expert bodies have also defined and described newborn health as a right, such as the Parma Charter and the Abu Dhabi Declaration. And these declarations call for rights such as survival, health, development, legal identity from birth, protection from harm, violence, and neglect, and even caring, loving, nurturing environments, even in humanitarian and fragile settings. Unfortunately, these rights are not respected or protected in all settings, particularly for the most vulnerable newborns. And it is important that countries translate these rights into domestic laws and regulations and incorporate them into pr protocols and guidelines for newborn care. Healthcare professional associations and civil society play an important role in ensuring these rights are protected. The second major global initiative to reflect on is the Sustainable Development Goals. For the report, we conducted a mapping exercise of the 17 SDGs to newborn care 
in order to see the important links to other development goals. The mapping reveals a strong connection to 14 targets within eight SDGs. So improving small infant newborn care will do more than help us meet the specific health target for newborn mortality. It will also support efforts on goals relating to poverty, hunger, health, education, gender equality, and clean water and sanitation. The third item to draw attention to from the report is the continuum of care concept. This figure presents the basic health packages across the continuum at different levels within the health system. Interventions with the most benefit for small and sick newborns can be integrated at different points along this continuum. The highlighted section here shows the level and packages of care that we focus on most in this report, those for inpatient care of small and sick newborns. It should also be noted that small and sick newborn care programs need to be integrated into compassionate and learning care in the first thousand days, so from pregnancy to three years of age, to prevent developmental delays and physical disabilities. While this framework focuses on the intervention packages, we also recognize that the way in which the packages of services is delivered is just as important as the content of the package. And according to the Lancet Global Health Commission on High Quality Systems, an estimated 61% of newborn deaths could be averted with good quality care on interventions we know of today. Finally, we wanted to show the WHO framework for integrated people-centered health services. This framework was adopted by the World Health Assembly in 2016 and focuses on five interdependent strategies for integrated and people-centered care. And these strategies are listed on the slide here. And importantly, it recognizes the need to empower and engage informal care providers with family members and others who play a critical role in healthcare. There needs to be greater alignment across the health system with communities and policies to enable and support healthcare providers, community healthcare workers, and people to work together. And in this report, the person at the center of this figure is the vulnerable newborn. Often it is, it is the mother and the newborn as a unit, but not always. So to ensure application of people-centered care for small and sick newborns, an approach is needed to maximize the role of parents and family members while the newborn is cared for in the health facility. And this is called family-centered care. Family-centered care promotes a mutually beneficial partnership among parents, families, and healthcare providers for patients of all ages. So it's not specific for newborn health. Um, and it builds upon concepts from the people-centered care framework and includes the following principles, dignity and respect, information sharing, participation, and collaboration. Specific to newborn health, a family-centered care approach encourages mothers, fathers, and caregivers to be active partners in their child's care. The parent and the newborn, in most cases the mother-baby dyad, are a unit of care which is central to the newborn's well-being and development. Family-centered care for newborn health has a growing evidence base and has demonstrated benefits for infants, such as weight gain and neurodevelopmental progress, as well as decreased parental st stress and anxiety and increased caregiving efficacy. Some trials testing comprehensive family-centered approaches have taken place across various settings, including China, Canada, Australia, the US, and India. And Dr. Carroll will be speaking on the India example after I speak. And there's a common myth that allowing parents and family members to visit a child in the, IC in the NICU will introduce infections. And the fact is that a family-centered care approach uh, does not increase infections and can prevent infections with good hand hygiene practices and access to human milk. And parents are powerful agents of change. It has been demonstrated historically uh, time and time again in the care of small and sick newborns. So for example, parents successfully lobbied for family-friendly hospital changes and pain management for preterm newborns. Parents also become patient experts with a deep knowledge of the issues relating to their child. And this results in them becoming assets to the broader healthcare system, serving as advisors to hospitals, other parents, and even policymakers. Parent advocacy and support organizations often emerge spontaneously when affected parents decide to raise awareness and share their experience to help others in the same situation. Some examples on the slide are from Colombia and France, and there are many others in the report. Empowering parents through advocacy and support groups and harnessing their passion and commitment can influence policy and the quality of care for newborns. 
Uh, for example, here's a powerful quote and a picture from Silky Matter, and she's presenting at the one o'clock uh, webinar for this session. And so if you want to hear her story, you can join that session as well. Uh, and she's a affected parent uh, and an advocate, and she went on to uh, become the founder of the European Foundation for the Care of Newborn Infants and the Global Alliance for Newborn Care. And so this is an example of one established parent group, and they have more than 50 countries and about 90 organizations represented in their network. The support provided by a larger, more established group such as EFCNI can nurture new leadership through mentoring and networking at local, national, and global levels. They also influence policy and programs. They recently partnered with the healthcare professionals and parent representatives to develop the European Standards of Care for Newborn Health project. And they all they initiated, they were amongst the organizations that initiated World for Maturity Day, and they continue to lead in the global planning every year around that. Another powerful parent story that's shown in the report is from uh, Selena Bentham from Ghana. And her son, King Luther, was born at just 31 weeks gestation, weighing 1.4 kilograms. She practiced KMC on King Luther, which went well, but her overall experience of inpatient care for her son and herself was still very stressful and expensive. Um, nonetheless, today, King Luther is three years old, healthy and bursting with energy, as you can see in this beautiful picture. And um, Selena has gone on to become a walking, talking advocacy machine, uh, really affecting change um, across the continent and having founded the African Foundation for Preterm Babies and Neonatal Care. Another example of a powerful parent uh, advocate who's affecting change. And so finally, we're going to shift to lessons from the past, um, and we're going to see how we can, what we can learn from countries that have already substantially reduced their neonatal mortality. Uh, this is a busy slide, and don't worry, we'll walk through it a bit, um, but it depicts a transitional model of newborn care. Uh, on the left side, we see the historical neonatal mortality rate trends for the U.S. and the U.K., which had dramatic declines across three phases, and these are shown in the three colors, and I'll talk, these, talk us through these. So shown in blue, phase one saw a decline in neonatal mortality by 25% in the early 1900s, and was characterized by a broad public health approach. This includes hand washing, an increase in skilled birth attendants and physicians, and the role of parents as the primary caregiver. Shown in orange, Phase two saw a relative decline in NMR by 50% in the mid 1900s. And this was characterized by a shift towards individualized special care for sick newborns. But also there was an emergence of some harmful practices, such as overuse of technology and separation of newborns from parents. And finally, phase three shown in green saw the relative mortality decline of 75%. And this was characterized by high quality intensive neonatal care provided within a strong health system by specialized skilled workers and where family centered nurturing care focused on uh, disability free survival uh, as the best practice. And what we learned is that change across all three phases is required in order to achieve the SDG target for newborns to survive and thrive. And today, many countries have implemented these components depending on where they are in the phase. And so you can see that we've already plotted the global average as well as re two regions on this, on this figure. Um, and health policy experts and practitioners should first look at where their starting point is in terms of their mortality and um, their phase and what priorities uh, they should be considering. And then take from the lessons of um, the lessons from the past that are presented in, in this report and apply those to improve special and intensive care and consider how to integrate a family centered care approach. The phasing approach is used throughout the report, and it's important to grasp that this builds from a historical analysis of our lessons learned. Uh, in terms of the lessons from the past, just a couple of quick summary points to take away. Routine separation puts mother and, and newborns at risk for medical and developmental complications, regardless of setting or level of care. And we need to rapidly scale up family-centered care, special and intensive newborn care that focuses on disability-free survival, and also empowered, competent, and equipped health care providers. 
this report shows that trans transforming care for small and sick newborns will mitigate intergenerational poverty and strengthen each nation's human capital. Future webinars will show what it is required to do this, including understanding the burden and where to target investments, the importance of delivering quality of care at scale, how we can ensure nurturing and responsive health care that is designed to prevent disability, support cognitive function, and promote nurturing newborn care to support early childhood development and reduce stunting growth, what data we have and what data we need to monitor progress, and what actions are needed now to save more than 1.7 million newborns each year, and what standards we have to support those actions. And I just want to end by saying thank you to the many authors who contributed uh, to the report, but especially those who supported bringing the important role of families and parents uh, to this report, as well as those parents who kindly shared their stories of um, that are just bring a face to this high burden of 30 million babies every year who uh, require small and sick uh, newborn care. Uh, and that burden is very big and behind each, each number there's a face, there's a story, uh, there's a family. Thank you very much. Hello. Hello. Hello, Dr. Kara. Yeah. Go should ahead. I, should I start now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Greetings to all of you from India, and uh, dear participants, dear panelists. Now I will be presenting the India experience in the care of the newborn. You know, as you're all aware, that India is a large country where 25 million births happen every year, and out of these 25 million births. You know, roughly around 15 to 20 percent children, babies are born as low birth weight and the preterm. So they are basically, you know, high risk children, high risk newborns. You know, in spite of, you know, large interstate and the geographical variations, you know, we have been able to demonstrate a persistent decline in the neonatal mortality rate in the last decade. And at present, the neonatal mortality rate in India is you know, 23 per thousand live births. And another point which I wanted to mention here is that if you look at the India, you know, kind of a comparison with the global average, the neonatal mortality rate in India has declined by 55% during the MDG era in comparison to the 49% decline noticed globally. Now, all these, you know, kind of achievement which have been demonstrated in India, you know, this has been possible can I have the next slide? So this has been possible by following, you know, the basic principles of the life cycle approach. This is the kind of the approach, you know, which has been adopted by India, which has shown real, you know, good results. One is, you know, India adopted the India Newborn Action Plan, which is nothing but the adaptation of the every newborn action plan. And then we have followed the health system a strengthening approach with the element of universal coverage and with a special focus on of financial protection. Now, beside that, beside health system strengthening, where we worked on developing the dedicated special newborn care units, which I will be describing in the next slides. But we also made a lot of investment in terms of, you know, community intervention, in terms of the outreach work, in terms of, you know, engaging our, you know, community health workers in the care of the newborn. And beside that, we have also given a special attention to the area of Thrive by addressing areas around nutrition, by areas around the addressing adolescent pregnancies, or you know the interval between the pregnancies. There are kind of a multiple approaches which have been uh, put in place. So this is you know broadly the concept, kind of the concept you know which has been adopted by India in order to improve the health of the newborn. The next slide. Now I will, you know, especially focus on on some of those, you know, good initiatives which have been talked about. And one of the important initiative is the, you know, addressing the care of the small and the sick newborn. Because, you know, historically in the past, the small and sick newborn care was available only in the tertiary institutions, only in the medical colleges. So in India, you know, we started experimenting in terms of developing special newborn care units at the district level. We started with a small pilot 
and now they have been expanded to all the district in the country where we have 12 to 24 bedded unit at the district level now as you know that in india even the districts are so big because one district is the average population is around two to three million so what we did was even at the sub district level we also established something called as the newborn stabilization unit to provide immediate care to the sick newborn because the quantum and the burden which i just shared with you 15 to 20 percent they are the low birth weight or the preterm children and these babies require some technical assistance and then you know the and we are admitting around a million of sick newborn per year with a less than 10 percent mortality and another important point to notice which, which we have introduced in our system is which is called as the SNCU online reporting system. And I will, you know, especially like to acknowledge the, you know, the, the contribution of Dr. Gagan Gupta, who is in, presently at UNICEF, you know, who has been the pioneer in developing this SNCU online system for India. Now, besides this SNCU online reporting system, we also have a lot of investment in terms of, you know, coming up with a 14 days skill-based training package. And it is not only skill-based training package, which is also followed by a mentoring. You know, we have identified collaborating institutions as medical colleges, you know, who do the hand-holding work, who do continue to mentor so that the quality of the services which is being provided at the SNCU is of a high quality. There are efforts in terms of, you know, at, uh, promoting breastfeeding. There are, you know, Kangharu mother care and even the concept of the family participatory care which was referred by mary in her presentation which is called as the family centered care but in india we call it as a family participatory care where we try to engage the the mother or the caregiver in 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 the provision of the care during the sick newborn so because once the, once the child gets discharged from the snsu the mother can you know take care of the child i'll talk about that family participatory care Maybe in the next slide. Next slide, yeah. Next slide. Hello. Next slide, yeah. Now you know. Beside, uh, yeah. You know, beside the provision of the care of the small and sick newborn at the facilities which have been established across the country, you know, we also made necessary arrangement to do a follow up of these essential discharge because these are the newborns because we noted with our SNCU online data sets that the large number of the SNCUs who were being discharged, you know, they were dying while going home. So, you know, we made special arrangement using our community health worker, which is our ASHA worker. So she is doing a follow up. And beside that, we have also incorporated element of, you know, birth defect screening at birth for all the newborns, because as on today, 80% deliveries are happening in the institutions. So we have introduced a very simple mechanism of screening for birth defects. And if the birth defects can be identified early, then their management is also linked simultaneously. And another point which has been added into the system is the you know, developmental screening. Like you know, screening for the retinopathy of prematurity and even the screening for hearing. And even for other development delays, you know, we have also been able to introduce in our system. And we have also linked them with the early intervention centers. Now, these are the two kind of intervention which I thought of mentioning here, because these are the two interventions because large number of sick newborns which are admitted, they are because of the prematurity. And that's why the government of India introduced the antenatal corticosteroids for preterm births, you know, from 24 to 34 weeks. But, you know, there are number of, you know, conditionalities have been put that we should be able to measure the gestation period appropriately. So there are a number of things which have been in, introduced, but antenatal corticosteroid is one intervention which has been introduced to reduce the load of, you know, preterm children. And then the injection gentamicin, because sepsis is also one of the important causes by which the large number of newborn, new, newborn deaths happen, around 15 to 20% deaths happen. So we introduced the injection gentamicin by our auxiliary nurse midwife, that by the paramedical worker, for management of sepsis in the young infants at the community level, and even the pre-referral dose has also been introduced. The next slide. The 
Next slide. So this is in kind of the nutshell that we have more than 850 SNCUs across the country. We have more than 16,000 bed providing care to the small and sick newborn. We have around 10,000 trained providers and then all online reporting system is happening. And I told you more than 1 million newborns are getting admitted. Next slide. Yeah. Now, this is the, you know, another initiative which we call, call it as, you know, game changer intervention, which is called as the home based newborn care. Because we have for every village of the country, we have a dedicated worker, which is called as the ASHA worker. And we started this program where the ASHA worker is making six home visits to every newborn. And the first visit is done on the day of birth if there is a home delivery. Otherwise, it is on the third day. Then it happens on seventh day and, you know, so and so forth. Because majority of the deaths happen within one week of life. And about 12 million newborns are being visited per year, by, per year. And, you know, with this kind of approach, we have been able to improve the child rearing practices. We have been able to identify sick children at the earliest. And we have also added an element of, you know, mother and child protection card, which continues to, you know, monitor the development of a newborn using these simple tools. Next slide. Next slide, please. Yeah, now this is, you know, the kind of the lessons learned, you know, we have that we have done a, a big political commitment in order to address the newborn health. We have invested a lot of domestic resources under the National Health Mission Program in terms of establishing special newborn care unit and the NBSUs. And beside that, there is a dedicated investment in terms of capacity building. And I think the mentoring support through the institution collaboration is one of the important lessons learned. Unless the quality of the services is, is good at the SNCU, you know, we will not be able to get a confidence of the community. And then the third important point is the, you know, evidence-based program management using the SNCU online system. And then last but not the least is the engaging families. That is the family participatory care, because once she goes back, she feels confident in managing a, a sick newborn. And she also participates, you know, when the essential services are being provided. And then obviously the home visit as a, you know, we call it as a game, ch game changer in terms of improving the newborn rearing practices. And we have been able to demonstrate uh, the early initiation of the breastfeeding, exclusive breastfeeding to the tune of 55, 56%. So this is in short, the kind of the lessons we have learned. And then I have the last slide, you know, which talks about the way forward. Now, the way forward is because we have, we have while implementing this SNC program, we could see that the many of the mothers, mothers are getting separated from the newborn. Now, we came up with the concept of a zero separation of the mother and the newborn. We could find that the large number of the newborns who were admitted in the SNCUs, they did not require separation of the mother. That's why you now we are converting our SNCU into the mother and the newborn care unit. That means we have SNCU. Along with the SNCU, we have a dedicated MNCU unit also, where large number of the newborns could be admitted along with the mother, where mother can continue to give KMC, the breastfeeding can be continued, and then the kangaroo mother care is one of the important intervention which can be put into practice. So this is the kind of the way forward which we are proposing. And then the second is we also want to introduce the red ROP screening and also the birth defect screening and even the inborn error of metabolism is also proposing to be introduced. And then the third important, you know, the element which we are looking forward is in terms of, you know, which is called as the human milk banking. And in India, we call it as a comprehensive lactation management unit where we have the dedicated breastfeeding counselors because we have large number of preterm children. And if you know we, they can be provided with the donor milk, the human milk at these comprehensive lactation management centers, you know we should be able to address large number of you know the feeding, you know the needs of the preterm children. And then the fourth important way forward is because India is so big and the private sector is contributing in a big way in terms of care of the sick newborn. So we have a big program, health insurance scheme, which is called as the Ayushman Bharat where we have the objective to achieve the universal health coverage by engaging the private sector. 
So I think engaging private sector is also one of the priority of the government of India. So this is in short my presentation on the experience of India in terms of the care of the newborn. Thank you very much. All of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. This was Dr. Kira, who is the commissioner for maternal, child and adolescent health in the Ministry of Health of India. Thank you very much for this, um, this country examples. Um, I'm passing uh, the, the ball of the floor again to my colleague, uh, Dr. Nela Linseto, who will talk very briefly about the impact of COVID-19 in providing maternal and newborn care. Oh, Nela. Important as we are facing uh, the COVID pandemic, to have uh, uh, to include a couple of slides on uh, how uh, the COVID can uh, impact uh, on the maternal and neonatal uh, services and uh, also on uh, what we should do to ensure that the uh, recommended intervention are uh, uh, in place despite the uh, epidemic. So just two slides. So the first slide is on the impact of COVID on maternal and neonatal services. Uh, as you know, um, uh, there is potential, uh, a lot of impact, uh, not of COVID directly, because uh, chill, newborns doesn't seem to be very much affected, but more uh, indirect impact. And but WHO fundamentally has uh, defined because of this concern of uh, uh, the indirect effect uh, uh, of COVID, we have already uh, very clear stated that the maternal and neonatal health services, including the uh, small and sick newborn care services, remain core essential service during the pandemic, meaning that they, they have to stay in place they cannot be displaced by the uh, COVID-19. Uh, of course, with the necessary adaptation to ensure that the services are, uh, are safe. So with the in integration of uh, IPC measures as recommended for uh, the other services. We have, have already seen the COVID response is impacting, however, on the availability, accessibility, and quality of uh, uh, services for pregnant women and newborns, and in fact, uh, been, uh, while we don't know the exact uh, impact that the pandemic will uh, will have on uh, on the maternal and neonatal health because it's a new virus, uh, um, it has been uh, some, the modeling that has been done by different uh, institutions shows that even a modest decline of 10% in the coverage of services can result in additional uh, uh, 28,000 maternal deaths and 168,000 newborn deaths. And if you can, and we are talking only about 10% here, reduction in coverage. So it's very important to maintain the service. Next slides. And then the second concern is on the fact that uh, uh, with the restriction, but with the concerns actually with the fears of, uh, of COVID, infection, uh, sometimes some countries have put in place uh, policies that are not in strategy that are not with the uh, evidence that we are collecting. So I have put uh, just a few recommendations in, in, uh, that are from WHO on uh, COVID. Uh, um, if the mother has suspected probable confirmed with the 19 infection, uh, so, um, first of all, uh, we know that there is, not, for the moment, that there is no definitive evidence of vertical transmission of the infection of COVID-19. Uh, so, uh, and the few babies that uh, have experienced, uh, of, of, that uh, tested positive, uh, um, usually tested positive after birth, and, uh, and in any case, they had the mild illness or, or were totally asymptomatic. So, and uh, there are still very few cases. So, in terms of uh, clinical care, if the mother is suspected to probably confirm uh, COVID-19, um, we are uh, uh, recommended the mothers and infants should be able to stay together. Birth, so, in skin-to-skin -to -skin -to -care, uh, care at the time of birth, be together in rooming day and night, especially during the establishment of breastfeeding. And uh, also, uh, of course, a mother is allowed to breastfeed her baby because uh, there is no evidence of transmission of the virus in amniotic fluid or in vaginal secretion or in breast milk. So there is no 
reason for separating mothers and babies. The, sec the other point I want to make is uh, if the newborn is uh, sick, or whatever, and is admitted in the neonatal unit, also the positive or suspected positive mothers should be supported to express breast milk and give to their baby. They should be, the unit should put in place arrangements to, uh, to allow access of the mother to the unit. This means isolation uh, room for the baby and as well as appropriate uh, IPC measures for uh, the mothers. So for uh, the mother to be able to do breastfeed or practice into skin, of course, she should wear a mask and practice respiratory and hand hygiene as you can find in our guidelines. So that is uh, uh, for uh, this, uh, uh, just briefly, uh, for this webinar, but in the subsequent webinars, we will present also as evidence come up, um, uh, COVID slides um, that are uh, uh, relevant for the, for the, the, the chapters. So on the, on the data or the interventions or the, uh, modeling and so on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Onela. We have yeah, the next one. Yeah, I wanted to conclude the, yeah, the webinar, I mean, the, 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 our presentation, joint presentation, by saying that the, for the transformation of this more than sick newborn, uh, we, are, we have uh, worked, uh, you know, for the report, we have worked with many partners, as you can see in the, in, uh, you know, in the, the logos of this. Um, in the slides, but uh, we count also on the support of these partners to ensure that the services uh, for newborn remain accessible during the COVID, and we together face uh, continue to work for expansion of the quality and uh, for expansion of the services for ensuring quality of services for small and sick newborn. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have about 20 minutes for the many, many questions that you have sent. So I will start reading them out for the presenter. The first one is for Mary. Can you throw more light on the disability free survival program and then come from Priscilla Vobil? Thank you so much for your question, Priscilla. Yeah, so the, um, the developmentally supportive care uh, improves outcomes for newborns by placing them in a nurturing and family centered environment um, with respect and minimal stimulation and maximizing information sharing between providers and families. And, and this agenda is really discussed a lot uh, in the fourth chapter of the report and will be presented on the 16th of June uh, with experts in that field. So I would encourage you to join uh, that webinar and uh, engage in discussion specifically there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a question for Dr. Dr. Kera, um, on how is India planning to link level three and level two SNCU care when there is actually very few level three NICUs in the public sector? You know, because we have now excellent experience in operationalizing the SNCUs, which are called as the level two. We also want that the tertiary level institutions should also be built and which are being called as the neonatal intensive care units. And then beside that, I also made a mention that at the sub-district level, there is a big proposal to strengthen those units. Large number of newborns who come to the SNCU, most of them could be managed at the sub-district level. So, you know, there are efforts in terms of, you know, strengthening the NBSU number one, which takes care of the large number of unnecessary load at the SNCU. And beside that, that we, we are also you know, making a big investment in terms of you know, strengthening the so-called the level three you know, at the medical colleges or at the tertiary level institutions. Thank you. Um, another question for Dr. Kera. Again, um, sorry. On like on, on like Shia, which does not include quality improvement is an NCUs because it focuses on the labor room, the operation theater, and the postpartum ward. Is the ministry planning to add this component to Lakshia? And if so, when? No, no, absolutely, because you know, we give a lot of importance to the area of quality in general, you know. So quality, we are when we talk about quality, we 
we talk of quality across RM and CHA, and when we talk about RM and CHA, it talks about reproductive health. That is the quality is important. Besides that, the quality in SNCU is also very critical. And we are you know, giving a, we have come up with a you know special kind of you know the, the indicators which will help us in improving the quality at the SNCU. Thank you. Another question by Tomomi Kitamura on um, on the India experience. Could you tell us more about the follow up by Asha? Uh, that to say the link with the linkage between hospital and Asha. When there is problem with small infant at home, how is it financed, etc. Hello. Yes. Can you hear me? Can you again repeat the question? Can you t tell more a little bit about the follow up by the Asha? And the linkage between the hospitals and the ASHA when there are problems. Okay, okay, okay. You know, there are two very important things which I would like to mention for the purpose of the audience. You know, one is, you know, every newborn is entitled for a free treatment and a free transport to a hospital. Because we notice that because people are poor, they do not have enough money. So they were not taking their newborn to the hospital. Now, ASHA, has, ASHA is now promoting the sick newborn to go to the SNCU and we are taking care of their financial protection and even the free medication is also being provided. So that's, you know, one linkage is which Asha is doing while doing the home visits. And secondly, you know, after the children or the babies are discharged from the SNCU, you know, she makes a visit to that particular sick newborn and the, there's a kind of a dedicated funding is available and our Asha worker, as you all may be aware, she is a incentivized, she is a performed worker, she does an activity and she gets the performance based incentives. So she makes those kind of visits after the follow up of the SNCU discharge children. And beside that, all the newborns across the countries, there is a home visits are made. And I told you the visits are made on zero day, the third day, the seventh day, the 14th day, 28 day and the 42 days. You know, in all those days, you know, she does that, you know, she promotes the child rearing practices and she has been capacitated to identify a sick newborn at the earliest and also improve feeding practices. So I think this kind of a mechanism of, you know, linking between the hospital and the community has made a real difference in terms of the neonatal outcomes. You know, I told you around 50% of the newborns are visited. 50% means around 12 million newborns are being visited by the ASHA workers. We keep on calling it as a, a game changer intervention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, a question which relates to the, the slide that Onela Linchito presented. How can COVID-19 epidemic be an opportunity as well as a threat for small and sick newborn care? Uh, can be an opportunity because uh, also because uh, I think uh, certainly um, you know one of the weak uh, elements in the care of a small and sick newborn uh, is uh, IP in infection prevention uh, and uh, in health facility and washing health facilities as we know and um, sepsi is uh, one of the main causes of death. So all of the uh, interventions that we are putting in place uh, for uh, protecting women and the babies from, uh, from uh, COVID will have also benefit uh, in uh, protecting uh, baby because, uh, babies from infection uh, uh, also for the future. No, so that is one. I think that is certainly important. Then uh, I think we will, um, that is the main opportunity. We will have, uh, of course, uh, I think to join a lot ends to highlight what are the risk of uh, an, uh, uh, not uh, not uh, of a time not evidence based uh, interventions in this uh, in this context. So we are working very much now uh, really to to promote uh, you know to show that uh, skin to skin uh, uh, kangaroo mother care breastfeeding remain fundamental and uh, we hope that this also during the covid and in the covid uh, uh, con positive women so that will be something that we will continue to promote uh, and uh, both in our facilities and at home and then the linkages i mean uh, the importance of the linkages between our facility and 
opportunities that uh, I think would be uh, would be necessarily strengthened. So I hope that uh, we will also be able to use uh, the COVID as an opportunity to um, provide better care for uh, women and babies. But it's challenging. In many countries, it's very challenging, I, I have to say. Thank you. Um, and I know my colleague Rajesh Mehta is on the call from WHO Sierra region. And maybe you could briefly mention um, the region guidance on the continuity of services. Rajesh? Oh, sorry. I need to make Rajesh. I apologize. Um, Rajesh, we can hear you. You need to give me a second. Sorry. Here we go. You can now unmute yourself, Rajesh. You unmute. Uh, all right. Uh, is my voice clearing now? Yes, perfect. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so thank you so much for Mary Kinney's presentation and Dr. Rajesh Khera's uh, presentation. Very comprehensive view of what India has achieved. And there's a lot of potential which is unrealized. And with the support of partners, I think the government of India will achieve much more. But concern has been about this interruption of services, as uh, Ornella mentioned to you guys, that uh, there is a clear risk based on previous experiences at the time of Ebola. And even now, that more deaths will happen among women, children, and newborns of other causes, not because of COVID itself. So we already knew from India and from neighboring countries that hospitalization has already dropped because of multiple factors. Many of them are operating from the client side, which is uh, ability to travel, uh, their perception of safety at the hospitals, because everywhere COVID, COVID, COVID is being heard. So they are not coming out even for deliveries. And uh, the anecdotal evidence was that deliveries uh, every month have reduced, a newborn admission have reduced. So this may be anecdotal at the moment, but the general perception in several countries has been 25% to 50% under utilization compared to pre-COVID, uh, pre-lockdown phase. So this is a clear problem. And therefore we assemble this uh, partnership in the region, uh, primarily and UNFPA coming together to countries uh, through agencies and partners that uh, the country's uh, realization that there is a serious need to protect uh, routine essential services for mothers, newborns, and children, uh, and how do we uh, help them. So there is global guidance available from multiple agencies, WHO, UNICEF, and UNFPA. So we assembled all the knowledge together uh, for regional guidance, and I will just list to you what we have recommended in this guidance so that the countries can consider uh, several ways to protect these services so that services continue. Uh, so, we, uh, this is non negotiable. Uh, this uh, outbreak is going to last longer than what we expected. So, we'll have to live with this virus for years, nobody knows. So, the essential services, SRM and CAH. That means family planning and sexual health and maternal health, even adolescent health. All these services must be prioritized as essential uh, during panic pandemic response to the COVID virus. And we are happy to work with countries to prepare plans. The countries have already made some plans for continuing this. And this regional guidance can be, you know, consult consulted uh, to review and revise the plan. The countries which are making plans now, this guidance is very handy. So what we have said is all three agencies and at six agencies together, national standards of care must there should not be any compromise on the number of interventions made available, and there is no compromise on quality of care which must be ensured. Uh, so of course the strict in infection prevention and control practices would be ensured. Uh, the protective equipment should be supplied to both clients and the service utilization. Uh, both clients and health workers should have access to proper PE, PPE. Uh, especially the barriers of access to clients must be considered. Dr. Khera was saying, saying there is end-to-end, door-to-door support available uh, through national program. But if the police is stopping the ambulance or the 
there are no clear you know uh, coordination with the police and judiciary uh, to make that happen uh, this uh, uh, this will not uh, be uh, the services will not be accessed so therefore there has to be a multi sectoral plan uh, Thank and you. we are saying there should be a monitoring of these services regularly and as soon as covid response eases out we must restore the services and to the covid uh, level so therefore these are broad guidances and we have come out with the uh, practical considerations in the second document which was released yesterday so so we are working with the governments and governments already agree uh, so we are happy to you know work to ensure that mothers newborns children continue to get the services thank you Thank you very much, Rajesh. And uh, there are follow-up questions on this for Dr. Kera from uh, Atna Fugetachu asking um, whether we have evidence in India on the continuity of service at this point. Yeah, you know, we are keeping a very close tab on the progress of the RMNC services utilization. And uh, as Dr. You know, Rajesh Mehta was also mentioning, that there is some evidence that the so-called the facility utilization has reduced because of this COVID. But now recently, what has been done that the government of India has issued guidelines and they have identified few essential services. And out of those essential services, RMNC services have been identified as one of the important essential services. Now, what is being further done is that you know now we are trying to do some kind of a rationalization of the contact. Now, instead of you know making visit to every newborn, you know the ASHA worker will make visit. She will use the power of technology. She will use you know telephonically consultation, telephonic counseling. She will do, and beside that, she will do only high risk you know visit only to the high risk children. So you know we are working on a complete operation guidelines where the whole concept remains but it will be you know kind of a more rationalization will happen and even similarly in the in, in the form of you know transporting children what kind of ambulances are to be used and also in terms of you know the overall management of this rmnc or newborn services you know we have dedicated covid hospitals across the country the COVID positive people are going to the dedicated COVID hospital, but rest of the hospital can continue to deliver, continue to provide RMNCH related services and specifically the, you know, the newborn related services. So you will find that some guidelines will come up, which will help us in bringing back the utilization back where, where we were. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kara. I have uh, one more question for Mary and then one more for you, Dr. Kara. We cannot answer them all because it's a large group of people. The one for Mary is uh, regarding obstacles. You mentioned infrastructure, but what other obstacles do, do you face? Other challenges? I think that there are obstacles across all of the um, health um, systems building blocks, including investments and financing. Um, also, health worker uh, being having the right skill sets, having enough, um, having uh, con continuity of care, and not being transferred. There are a lot of other um, barriers, and those are likely going to be discussed mostly in Chapter Three, uh, and uh, that will be taking place. I'd have to look at the date uh, on when that's going to be. Uh, I don't have it in front of me, or you can say, but I, I think it's it's coming up in the, the third series of this webinar um, and Ornella will be leading that and she can also comment on it. Thank you. Um, yes, it's another webinar that we're planning this series. And a last very question, very last question for Dr. Kira, um, uh, wondering about adapting for other country. She's wondering, Madeline Morgan is wondering if the India's 40 days training curriculum and mentoring program would be available for other to adapt and adopt and learn from. You know, certainly, I think, you know, I, I will again, you know, like to mention there are two, you know, important learning. And one of the important learning is which you made a reference to a dedicated 14 day skill day training program, skill training program, and, and supported by a mentoring program. But the most important thing to my mind is, you know, SNC online system. This SNC online system has really, you know, empowered us as a program managers. 
we have a complete understanding across the country how many new bonds are getting admitted what type of new bonds are getting admitted what are their outcomes i think snc online is one kind of intervention which should be adopted by all the countries if they really want to have a handle on their newborn health so this is you know kind of a suggestion which i would like to make at this point of time thank you very much Thank you so much, Dr. Kera. Thank you very much, Mary and Onela. Uh, we will send the presentation and the recording of this webinar to all of you registered. It will also be on the qualityofcarenetwork.org website. Onela, I will now give you the floor to close this session. I would like to, to thank uh, everybody for uh, the participation, the panelists, first of all, and, the, and uh, um, to all the participants. I saw that you were really very many from uh, all over the world. And um, let's continue to stay together for the next chapters, and uh, let's continue to join hands to expand the services for uh, uh, small and sick newborns and for the newborns in general. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your participation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.